Describe Mr. McBride in one word. Hmm. One word. Oh, jeez. Hmm. <laughs> um. Well, the first word that comes to mind is old. But to really encapsulate McBride, I think interesting. If I had to describe Mr. McBride in one word, it would be knowledgeable, just because of all of the pure amount of things that you could ask him and he knows, or he knows somebody who knows. I think passionate is the biggest one that comes to mind for me. Passionate. I originally, um, when I graduated from high school, uh, wanted to go into the Army, so I went through ROTC and uh, ended up with an education degree in history and then a master's degree in world civilizations, which is also history. And because the Army didn't seem like a career that I wanted to go through, I went through the National Guard for a while and ended up becoming a high school history teacher. I remember being kind of intimidated by him because one of the first things he said in class was like, you do not do anything in pencil in this class, it has to be pen, it has to be black or blue ink, you have to put your first and last name, otherwise you lose points, and I was just like, okay. I remember his classes not feeling like a class, but more like a conversation, or like him telling a story, which is really what I think got me interested in his class and a lot of other students. I was actually the trashiest student ever. I had like straight D's, except for Miss McBride's class because he actually made school interesting. I retired in 2019 after 35 years of uh, teaching high school history. In 2020, I retired from Heartland Community College as an associate professor of history. My father was probably one of my biggest influences. Um, he was a pilot in World War II at the end of the war and a pilot in Korea. My father and my uncles and everybody had been either in World War II or the Korean conflict at that point in time. Uh, so I went to a lot of Legion meetings as a little kid, hung out with a lot of veterans. At that point in time, there were still many, many World War I veterans around. And I hung out with a lot of those guys. By the time I had gotten to college, um, I had one professor uh, David McDonald, who really sparked my interest in ancient Greek and ancient Roman history. And I did a lot of reading, a lot of studying, um, several trips. First time I went was not a group trip, it was just he and I. It was actually our first date was to London. In class, we were taking a break and he just said, hey, do you want to go to London? And I thought, well, okay, he could be a serial killer, but I'm going to go ahead and go. And it worked out great. So we went to London. It was the first time I'd ever been overseas, and uh, I was pretty much hooked after that. I, I really, really liked ancient Rome. And when I had this opportunity to go to Pompeii and, you know, be an archaeological intern, uh, I jumped at the chance. Flew into Rome and then took the train down to Naples and met with an archaeology team and we weren't really archaeologists we were just interns and uh, we kind of just did a lot of the gopher work but through that I, I really just being able to have access to walk anywhere you wanted in Pompeii do anything you wanted look at anything you wanted visit all of these places really piqued my interest in ancient Roman history culture and civilization they had like the people who like died you know from like the eruption i don't know it was just weird like they were like frozen and it was just like they had like all this like ash or whatever over them they were like kind of preserved mummified almost and they had like dogs and it was just i don't know it's so, like that sticks out to me a lot it was covered probably about 30 feet down and it's not being an archaeologist is not indiana jones and it is not a little bitty tiny brush all of the time as interns, we were giving, given air hammers, jack hammers, and we were told to cut through all of this stuff. Well, ash and pumice and sand and everything like that, over the years with all the rain and everything, basically forms concrete. And that's what we were cutting into. It was like cutting concrete. 
it was something that I'd always wanted to do was travel. And that kind of sparked my interest in travel. And with that, I've been able to um, use that interest to get students to travel with me. And to this day, I've taken close to 1,000 people uh, over to Europe on student trips. So the first year we went to Spain and Italy, so we did a lot of southern Spain, and then I've seen a good majority of Italy throughout his trips. Uh, the second year we went to France and Italy, we went to Cannes in Normandy, and we saw like Pointe du Hoc and all that stuff. Some of my favorite trips have been ones that my students have suggested. One year we were able to go to London and go to the Imperial War Museum, the Tower of London, all those different types of things. Then we took, uh, we went to Portsmouth, which was the actual embarkation point of the U.S. troops for D-Day. And we actually took a ferry boat, a ship, across the English Channel and landed on the D-Day beaches. From there, we took buses over to Paris and then up to uh, Belgium, and we went through Bastogne and um, different places like that, all, all the different battles of World War II. If we wore our airborne jackets and all the all the northern French were like buying us food because they're obsessed with airborne stuff and they like love the reenactors that like come and do like D-Day reenacting like they love that stuff. Those are some of my favorite ones that stick out and you know I mean of course going to Greece and going to the Greek islands uh, and looking at all the history there. Obviously Greece was just beautiful just the sites there just the landscapes are beautiful so I just think about that a lot just like how the architecture was. I've been to Greece uh, with McBride. We went to like Athens and then we took like a cruise ship over to Italy. Most of the time, we always go to like Rome, so we always wind up in Italy at the end, but we always see some cool stuff before we get there. The city of Rome is, is my favorite. I mean, ancient Rome as well as modern Rome. All right, I just love everything about the city, the food, the culture, the people. Uh, and then of course, within the city of Rome, there's also Vatican City. Uh, which is really pretty cool. My favorite moment was uh, when we went up to uh, Point Du Hoc and we were wearing our, we had 101st and 82nd Airborne jackets and we were just talking to the French and they were like, oh, my grandfather was in this unit. We were like, oh, that's crazy. Our grandfather was in this unit and our great grandpas were all in the exact same location like 80 years ago. So it's like kind of cool to like intertwine your history with somebody else's history that you've never even met before just because it happened in history. Like you're somehow like can relate to each other, I guess. So that was pretty cool. Just randomly made friends with some Northern French guys. When you can set out history to somebody else who's never seen it, and just the amazement, the look on their eyes when they see something like the Colosseum or the Tower of London or the Eiffel Tower or Big Ben, those type of things and people look at them like, I never thought I would see this, I never thought I would do that. The first of seeing different places, I think the first time you see a lot of places, it's it's almost overwhelming, like say the Sistine Chapel, for example. It's so overwhelming, and it's, it's moving to see things for the first time. After you see them again the second time, you can kind of take it in more, but nothing's quite as exciting as seeing those iconic spots for the very first time, in my opinion. You, you look at everything all in one. It's culture, it's a civilization, you know, it's the people in the world. And to open up so many people's eyes to something like travel, all right, is just a great thing for me. As a younger kid, I would go to gun shows and flea markets and auctions and different things like that uh, to try to find stuff for my collection. I think it takes up a lot of space. <laughs> But it's his thing, and I would never want him to not do his thing. Um, some of it's interesting to me, some of it not so much. <laughs> but it's what he loves to do, so he should do it. Welcome to my collection room. This room here is my European World War I, World War II room. Across the top are just different German variations. Uh, the next two rows are mostly my German helmets. Um, some of them are World War I, some of them are World War II. And if you look here, this one would be the dreaded SS helmet. This is probably one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this is a World War II German tanker's uniform. They call it a Panzer uniform. 
and we have two German uh, uniforms. Uh, the gray one is from World War I, and the blue one is from just right before that, anywhere from the 1870s all the way up until 1912, 1913. This is a Zyklon B canister, a pesticide that was used in the Holocaust. Over here we have, like I said before, an SA mannequin. The SA was the brown shirts of the Nazi party. One of my favorites, I call it my Mussolini hat because it's a fez of Mussolini's fascist party. And it'd be like you would see Mussolini wear. The eagle that you see is an eagle off of a uh, train car and more than likely it would have been gathered somewhere near Dachau, so it was probably taken off of one of the concentration camp uh, train cars. Down here we have a Polish cap, and then of course we have a uh, concentration camp hat uh, that was liberated from Dachau. This is my American room. Most of my American uniforms and pieces of headgear are in here. Just starting right here, these are a lot of World War II Ike jackets that I've personally gotten from veterans. An original Civil War uh, cavalry jacket, an original Civil War frock coat for an officer, and an original Civil War uh, artillery jacket. Across the top are all of uh, my father's flight helmets. Uh, he, was, he was a principal, but during World War II and the Korean War, he was a pilot, and so he started collecting flight helmets. These discharges were personally signed by Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Stanton. Later on in the war, they used a secretarial signature. My guess is that this is probably a secretarial signature for Edwin Stanton and for Abraham Lincoln. Those things kind of pique people's interest. And then you tell them about where um, things came from, and they're like, wow, I'm holding something that is, you know, a thousand years old. And like I said, it, it sparks something in students. It was pretty intriguing because the people who weren't very interested in the subject that we were talking about when they would see the like if they were, we were doing medieval armor and he brought in the medieval armor they'd all put it on they'd be like wow this is freakishly heavy can't believe they would fight with all that stuff on and then they'd be just a little bit more interested because they actually got to be a part of it for just like two minutes but it was just enough to pique their interest to get them to listen I guess. Teaching history a lot of teachers struggle I think they struggle with getting like people interested and bringing in those items really makes it like real to the students because it's not like some far off story uh, that happened a hundred years ago you're holding it in your hands. While I was at a gun show in Hoopston, Illinois I ran into a, a person who eventually became a lifelong friend and he also was a collector and he and another gentleman, we all became friends and started running around to different shows together. I was probably about 14 or 15, but we all liked the same stuff, so they would pick me up and we'd go different places, and they decided that they wanted to do a Civil War reenactment, and this was in the late 70s. So uh, we ended up uh, doing this reenactment down in Newman, Illinois, and that's kind of my first start at it. We started reenacting Oh, probably about 1979, 1980. So I joined this unit. We, we did a lot of reenacting uh, within the Midwest, anywhere from Missouri, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota. When I became a teacher, I got more into the Civil War because that's what you, know, you taught in your curriculum. So I would always make sure that I got to World War II. And so I could do a, a bring in a lot of my artifacts and um, you know, explain what I do, and with that, several of my Tri-Valley students were interested in reenacting. When I was a kid, it was like super cool. Like all the guys like wanted to go out and like, we, cause we'd all play soldier or army and stuff when we were in like second grade. So when we saw like all the dudes like dying on the battlefield, we were like, I want to do it. As we got into high school, like they were like, you want to do it? So I was like, absolutely. And then when I was in high school, all the elementary kids would be like, this is so cool. They'd pretend to die on the battlefield. I was like, man, I was just there like seven years ago. At the base level, it's just a bunch of guys being dudes. Since we're all going out there having fun, have this like shared interest in history, and we're going out there and kind of, we all, all go out there for our own reasons, but I like to go out there and think that I'm trying to like educate the public and make them more aware that it's not all 
what the movies had and it was a lot different. We're here with our reenactment unit at the uh, Prairie Aviation Museum. Um, they've got a fly-in of a World War II B-25 plane. This is uh, really a good event for Prairie Aviation Museum. We're working together with the EAA, working together with Crosswinds Flying Club and the Bloomington Normal Airport Authority to try to bring attractions to the Bloomington Normal area so that folks can come out and not only see our museum, which has a, a number of static displays, but actually come out and learn about history and, and meet some of the folks that are involved with bringing these aircraft to life and, and letting people come out and go for a ride in them. But I do remember just like being in his class and feeling like I did have like a new perspective on a lot of things that I felt like I didn't get from other teachers. I feel like that's definitely just due to the way that he teaches things and the way he presents the information to people. I guess I'd just be more bored if anything because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't know as much, I wouldn't see as much as I see, I wouldn't know as many people as I knew. I wouldn't even be reenacting, so that would be kind of boring. I would probably would have never gone to Europe. I didn't decide what I wanted to major in until my senior year when I was a teacher's assistant for McBride and I was sitting there and I realized the only class that I didn't dread going to every, every so often was history and I was getting good grades in it. I was interested in the class structure and the content so I figured I'd study history. Before I met Mark I you know, had the average American's view of history and understanding of history, I, it was kind of like, I wasn't that into it. But since then, I've learned a lot about history and have a much more of an appreciation for it. If I've opened them up to history, if I've opened them up to travel, you know, they take it from there. All right, I'm just the person who first identifies, you know, hey, this is pretty cool, let's go do this. And once that happens, you know, most people say, oh, I want to do this again. And that's really the joy that I get out of it is that they enjoyed what they did, they enjoyed the history behind it, and they want to do it again. <laughs>